Welcome back to another episode of Making Imagination. I'm Wes. Today, I have a special guest uh, with me is uh, Emmy Award winning Mark Simon, the godfather of storyboarding. Um, today, we're going to be talking specifically about storyboarding, but he does so, so much more directing, producing, writing, author of several books. He's a speaker, entrepreneur, uh, and, and so much more. Uh, in terms of storyboarding, he, some of his credits include Stranger Things, The Walking Dead, Gossip Girl, uh, Doom Patrol, Woody Woodpecker, Dragon Tales, The Water Boy, Dexter, and honestly, that's just scratching the surface. So I'm very excited. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Mark. You bet, Wes. It's, just, it's good, uh, good to meet you. I know we have an old friend in common, so this is great. Yeah, so uh, today I did want to uh, dive in specifically to storyboarding. Uh, I know you kind of do a lot um, of other things, but you are kind of the godfather of storyboarding for, for several reasons. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to explore this aspect uh, specifically of animation, but um, I think uh, live action as well. Uh, the first thing I kind of wanted to ask you is, what is the essence of story guarding? You know, is it, is storyboarding, is it about staging? Is it about character beats? Is it about pacing? Is it previs? I mean, kind of what is story art, I guess, to the, to the layman? Oh, well, the easiest way to describe it, it's a comic book version of a script before it's shot. Uh, so really what we're working with, uh, we're working with the director to get their vision to demonstrate to the crew what they want. So I'll, I'll give you a, a quick example. Like on The Walking Dead, we have on every day, we have anywhere from 500 to 700 people working. And, you know, we've got a script that we have to figure out what we're doing in eight days. We have eight days of prep and then we shoot for eight days. Wow. About halfway through that eight days, we get a final script about day four. And that's when I come in and I work with the director who now has an idea of what they want. And I'll illustrate. We don't do the entire thing. We don't have time for that. We just do the scenes that have to do with stunts and special effects and fancy camera moves. But I illustrate the director's vision of every shot on these complicated scenes. And that goes out to the crew. So now the entire crew is working towards the director's vision. Because if you read a script and I read a script, we have totally different pictures in our head. But the only picture that matters is the director's vision. So my illustrations, if I do it right, is the director's vision. So that all 700 people now have the director's vision and we're all working towards one common goal. Okay. Now you mentioned um, specifically for The Walking Dead, um, getting a couple of days lead time to, to do some of those boards. Is there ever kind of a scenario where um, say it's shoot time and we have to reboard something uh, today or, or, or just is that less common? It's not necessarily that we're reshooting something today. I mean, that happens every once in a while. Uh, but generally, if they're already shooting, the director's got too many other irons in the fire to sit with me. So, you know, my work is done beforehand so that the, the uh, production management can plan and budget, stunts can, can be fully prepared and trained up and the special effects and visual effects can be prepared and starting to put their elements together and know what they're gonna do live versus what's blue screen or green screen. So it's, it's what I do is all part of the prep. There's always changes that happen because of a location that's not available, a new creative idea comes up or something. And the storyboards allow production to be so well prepared that it's easy to make an adjustment. Without properly planning, any one change can throw everything in a, into an uproar. But if you're only changing one thing and everything else is well planned, it's a lot easier to do, to creatively move along with what you need. So. Uh, now that doesn't mean there's not last like last second things. So, for instance, right now I'm uh, I'm storyboarding a really big episode on Fear the Walking Dead, and we start shooting on Tuesday, but Friday and Monday are holidays for the production, and we're finishing up this weekend on the storyboarding. And they keep changing the sets, which are affecting some of the shots. So even today, huh. I was making changes on it. But I have three more days of, uh, of drawing because we've got hundreds of more drawings that I have to finish before they start shooting. Holy cow. <laughs> huh. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, my, my limited experience 
uh, with production has been the more prepared you are, the better, the better off you are. Uh, so, you know, you have authored a lot of books um, among the many things that you have done. One of them is called, you know, storyboarding motion in art. Mm -hmm. uh, is that kind of how you tend to think about story art and, and approaching it? Do you, you tend to think of you know, everything is, has to be moving? Yeah, look, uh, both live action and animation, it's moving pictures. So, you know, in a still frame, I'm trying to represent what's happening. I'm representing not only the visual layout of each of what the camera is going to see for each shot, but hopefully helping to tell the story and breaking down the special effects and coming up with, you know, figuring out how to, uh, what kind of camera lens oftentimes will list on there on the storyboards. You know, all these different things that help the production create these moving images that we all love to watch. So our still art becomes motion art. But these days with the software that we use, the Storyboard Pro software that I worked on, we're actually able to create an animatic as we draw. Now, an animatic is basically a video storyboard. It's camera moves or layer moves of the artwork that I'm creating in real time as I'm drawing. So now it's moving artwork showcasing mm -hmm. what the animation or live action is going to look like when, it's, uh, when, when we actually shoot it and finish it. So it's, it's, it's more exciting for me as a story artist to see my art literally come to life as I'm sketching it. And the directors love it because working with me, they're figuring out, you know, what are the shots? How do I want to put this together? But then can instantly see it play right in front of them. So they know if the shots are working. So we're working out literally the huh. end before they shoot it. Every director loves it. I, they just absolutely love the process I work in. And, and very few artists work exactly the way I do, which is one of the reasons I, create the LinkedIn learning courses. I write my books and I lecture because I'm trying to get more people to work like I do in storyboarding because every director tells me, oh, I've never had this experience before. Well, they should. Everyone should work this way. Huh. Huh. That's, a, that's amazing. I mean, the range of projects that you work on is, is, is pretty broad. Yeah. Um, I, does that sort of, <laughs> I guess, how does that inform the way you approach uh, I guess sort of staging for your storyboarding. So for instance, if, if, you know, the sky's the limit, there's no budget, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I, I assume you could board this thing pretty ambitiously um, versus there might be stylistic restraints or, um, or budgetary restraints um, that might push you towards more conservative board. Do those things play into when you're boarding early on, or does that sort of get weeded out later? It does, but, but it's always the director's vision. I'm not just creating these things off the top of my head. I'm working one-on-one -on -one with the director okay. to get their vision down. If I was doing my vision, I'd be the director, which I often am. And, and I love doing my own breakdowns. But on a lot of shows, there's very specific ways the show is shot. You know, like on, uh, on Dynasty, another show that I storyboard. They have a very particular way they do close-ups. They don't never do extreme close-ups, and, mm. and the way they frame things is very specific to that show. So watching that show helps me storyboard closer to what the finished product is going to look like. So I being see. a fan is helpful. Another thing I do is when I get the script uh, and I get a call for a project, I find out who the director is. And if I haven't worked with them before, I go through and I look at other recent projects that that director has worked on because every director has a different visual style. And I study their work before I meet with them so that when I sit down and start drawing, I'm framing up the shots, even in my initial sketch, hopefully closer to what they're going to want. And then they're giving me you know, note, you know, notes in real time, or a little closer, move them a little further, camera left. So literally I'm getting approvals on my thumbnail stage. Instantly, within a minute, I'm getting approvals, which saves, a huge amount of time. I mean, it's three times faster than any other way of working. Um, but it's, I'm taking my cues from the director on, uh, on what we can't and can't do. Now there are times like there was a Netflix animated movie I worked on. I was a head of story on called Alien Xmas. And uh, that's a stop motion animation. And as we were working through development and pre-production and we started building all the puppets, 
the puppets, some of the puppets had to be so small, they could only do certain things. Hmm. So the limitations of what that type of animation could do did dictate some of the actions on how we were drawing our storyboards because we wanted to be accurate to what was possible. So when I would find that kind of information out, I would then pass that on to my crew so we were being accurate. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. You mentioned uh, thumbnailing too. Is that is that something you do for every storyboard you do? Kind of thumbnail it out first. Yeah, everyone does. I mean, it's just that's just common. I mean, you, you never go to finished art because you're going to throw a lot of stuff away. So yeah. thumbnail is just a really really quick sketch. You know, I will sketch out something in thirty to sixty seconds, and that that gives a director the ability. That my sketches are good enough. You can see exactly what's going on, and then I want the director to tell me, did I get what's in their head? If not, let's fix it right now. And then once we're done with the entire sequence, we go through, we watch it play out, make sure we didn't miss any shots, that it's playing properly. Then the director goes off to do everything else, which is a huge amount of work they have to do. And I, uh, I shut down my, uh, my Zoom call, like we're on right now. And then I spend time and clean them up. I put in all the proper notes, I make sure everything's numbered uh, properly. And I make the drawings look really cool because it's also an inspiration to the crew. Not only does it help tell them what their job is, what they need to do, but if I can inspire them, that's going to make the project better. Okay. You mentioned on, you know, things like the walking dead, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to board out every single shot, every single, you know, for the whole episode. Um, is that generally, um, is that generally just true across the board, whether you're working on films or shows that you don't sort of board every angle or does that change from project to project? In live action, you never storyboard everything. Okay. Because there's enough time for it. You know, a giant Marvel movie will storyboard more than most because so much of the special effects. But animation, everything is storyboarded. Every couple frames is storyboarded. They're the, it becomes the keys of the animation, all the extreme motions of every single motion the character does. That's wow. what the animators use to work from. But in live action, we're very specific on things that are necessary. You know, if it's just two, two people having dinner, we're not gonna storyboard that because that's easy to shoot. You don't need to plan that. You just point the camera, the director says, I want it here or here. Nothing needs to be planned for that. It's easy to, to budget and to plan how long it's gonna take to shoot. But if you've got two people having dinner and there's a ghost floating through and interrupting them and things are being picked up off the plate, well, what things? What's happening? What kind of interaction? Is it ghost going behind them or in front of them? Do we need to have special effects for it? Is it all going to be CG? Do we need to blue, be blue screen or green screen? Is it just foreground element? You know, are there certain things that need to be built into the set? Do they fall backwards? Do we need to have a stunt double for some of those things? Hmm. It, it ramps hmm. up. There's a whole bunch of things that are in consideration when you've got visual effects involved. That we would storyboard. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. Or even big camera shots with, you know, cameras up on a crane or it spirals down or it moves through a pipe. We'd storyboard that because that helps the DP and the gaffers figure out what is it that they need? What's the equipment they need? Do they need a, a certain kind of crane? Can it be a smaller crane? Does it need to be a 30 foot? You know, like today I was storyboarding a shot that starts close on a character and pulls back and, and goes way up to a 30 foot crane shot overlooking a virtual set. So now... How high do we? How high do we? Can we go? How? Where's the set extension going to be? Do we need to bring in more props, or or do we need to move some things around so we don't shoot off the backdrop? Uh, what kind of lens uh, does the DP have to put on so that we can make this look bigger than it actually is? I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it, but that's one of the reasons I storyboarded that shot. Okay. Now you mentioned in animation, you know, when you're, when you're boarding for animation, you'll do a lot of extremes um, and some of those poses, um, which is really very much a lot of the acting of animation. Two questions. One, has it sort of always been that way for animation, boarding animation, or has it become a more recent thing? Uh, and two, um, does that kind of mean you have to bring some of your acting chops to the pages <laughs> as you draw? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, it's always been that way for animation. Okay. Um, the storyboards are literally the blueprint of of what the animators need to do. And and you know, for for instance, if you're doing a thirty second uh, piece, you know, you could end up with three hundred drawings, two three hundred drawings for thirty seconds. Wow. Animation. 
Uh, it's, it's a huge amount. Okay. Um, a lot of it depends on the amount of action that's happening. Sometimes you don't need quite as many drawings, but you know, if I have a character chewing and it's really funny, if the mouth is skewing all over the place, I'm gonna have a keyframe here, keyframe here, keyframe here, keyframe here, keyframe here. You know, all of those in story just for one chew. I might have 10, 15 drawings if it's mm -hmm. a really extreme motion that we want to represent. So yeah, animation always uh, is always heavy, heavy, heavy on the amount of storyboarding. Uh, drawing that we have to do for it. Oh, huh, interesting. Do you find yourself discarding more drawings for animation projects just because there are more drawings to draw or, or is it sort of, um, you, you're more strategic about the ones you create because there are so many to do? Yeah, I mean, anytime you're doing more drawing, you're gonna throw more away. But the other thing that happens, if you're doing TV for animation, you know, like uh, Woody Woodpecker, I did both the TV series, the first series and the, uh, and the movie. And again, because it was a TV series, we did a tremendous amount. But in TV animation, you get notes either from the director or uh, generally the director or sometimes the uh, storyboard supervisor. But then the artist does their own breakdowns. You're not doing shot by shot normally. Okay. Sometimes you do, but usually in, in animation, the story artist is the director of breaking down every shot. So because of that, when the main director or the story supervisor looks at it, they might want you to change entire sequences. Whereas I never get that far. Now, that said, most story artists, the way they work in live action, get notes from a director, go away, do their thumbnails, then come back. Two thirds of it could be wrong because they don't get approvals as they go. I almost never have any changes unless, they're, unless the script changes. I get approvals on my first pass. So I'm doing maybe half as many drawings, which means I can spend more time making my drawings look better. And directors are happier because they're, they feel that now their vision is being represented. So it's so I have happier directors and I'm quicker at doing it. Hmm. You mentioned boarding for Woody Woodpecker, both the film and the show. Um, Woody Woodpecker was one that I loved growing up. Um, you know, it's kind of established property. Um, I... Does that, do you sort of feel that weight when you're going into a project like Woody Woodpecker? Do you sort of feel the sort of weight of like, this is an established IP, this is a beloved thing versus something more original? Or is it just sort of another project that needs your attention? Um, are they all sort of the same? It's not the same, but I don't feel pressure. It's fun. Okay. I mean, one of my favorite characters growing up is my dad's favorite cartoon character. And he and I used to watch them together when I was growing up. So working on it was a treat. Oh man, that's and awesome. The pressure is like, I get to work on Woody Woodpecker. I mean, this is so freaking cool. I mean, and there were times when I'd be working like on the movie when I was working with the director, I would say, but that's not the character. He needs to be doing it this way. Let's make huh. it bigger. Huh. So, so, you know, I, I would study, the, I study the characters. I, I try to know them as well as I can. And then I push as much as I can. I don't take, oh, you know, it's the director's final call, but as a story artist, it's my job, not only to get their vision, but try to plus their vision. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Now you've mentioned that you are also a director um, of animation and things. Do you find, do you find that it's easier to just sort of board your own projects or, or do you find that it's that you prefer to have another voice um, to, to sort of guide what you're doing in terms of um, just one less thing to make the final call on? I used to find it was easier. Uh, now I realize it's just a different muscle. I love okay. the challenge of getting the director's vision down on paper. You know, I've got lots and lots of tricks on how to get into your head if I was storyboarding for you. Um, so that I really enjoy. Like the director I'm working with right now was uh, Ron Underwood. He, um, he wrote and directed the first Tremors movie. Uh, just a blast to work with. The boards are looking awesome. I'm having an incredible time. When I'm the director, I love telling visual stories. And I, I sit on a script until I see a way of doing it in my head that will get people's attention. And I love breaking it down and figuring it out. So I don't really like one more than the other. I just, I love directing. I love having the visual control over it, but I love storyboarding for other people too. I mean, like I get to draw all day and tell stories. That's, that's my job. You have to tell it. It's just black and white drawing all day. And then I get to see the finished product on movie screens and TV screens. 
there's not much to hate about this. This is pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's us. That's true. That's true. So, you know, animated animated uh, shorts and films historically, and even I think um, presently, it seems like there's different approaches that that shows and movies take. Um, mostly shows, actually, I should say, not movies. Um, where sometimes there's a script and you're you're boarding from the script, mm-hmm. but some shows um, some shows are writing the episode in storyboard form. Um, there sort of is a very loose script, maybe it's dialogue. Um, have you kind of worked both ways? And- I have, yeah. Um, yeah, it's called board-driven versus script-driven. Okay. And uh, board-driven is more like the classic Looney Tunes where it's the visual gags that sell it where the humor is instead of written dialogue. Um, more and more shows now are all script-driven. Um, uh, SpongeBob was kind of a mix because it's such a visual show. Um, when they were hiring story artists on um, Phineas and Ferb, I did not work on it, but a good friend of mine did. They hired story artists who were also seasoned writers because it was a board driven show. They wanted that visual sense of storytelling more than just loading it up with dialogue. So it is, it is a different way of doing it. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that Primal, which is that cartoon uh, Cartoon Network series by uh, Gendy Tartakovsky of the um, of the caveman and his pet dinosaur, which is brutal but incredible. That look, and again, I haven't worked on it, but that looks like a board driven show because there's almost no dialogue at all. It's just the most incredible visuals because that's what Gendy is so fantastic at. He he also did the Samurai Jack, so same kind of visual style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Samurai Jack is like my favorite show, and I, I know that one was was heavily board driven, um, just in terms of coming up with the gags and their pacing was was pretty flawless um, with that show. But it's funny how sometimes it goes back the other way. So you know, for instance, on Alien Xmas, uh, as as I was the head of story, I ended up writing one of the drafts of the script because mm-hmm. I we the director and I realized that it, we were missing an element of it, and I was adding so much that we both just said, yeah, I just need to write one of the drafts here. So the third draft I wrote on uh, one of the Barbie movies, Barbie Video Game Hero, which we did, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago, something like that. I was also the head of story on that. I wrote, I rewrote the first act on that. The action just didn't work. You know, once we started doing the breakdowns, what they were, the story they were trying to tell just didn't flow once we saw the visuals. So I rewrote it so it worked. Huh. So would you say that's kind of um, the, the primary role of the head of story to make sure that, hey, the story we're trying to tell here is going gonna, is gonna to work on screen? Well, I mean, the head of story oversees all the story artists. It, okay. it tries to keep everyone organized and everyone working so it's one cohesive vision. And generally, the head of story is also one of the story artists. So it's not just management, it's also creative. I take it kind of a step further and really dive deep into the story with the directors as well. I mean, all us story artists are storytellers. That's why story is the first word of our title. Now you, um, another one of your, um, one of the things that you've sort of founded is uh, sell your TV, to, you know, sell your TV concept. Um, you've pitched uh, mm-hmm. ideas and shows and things. Um, as a story artist or someone who, who certainly does a lot of story art, when you're pitching things, do you use a lot of story art or, or do you tend to just sort of verbally pitch um, it, it depends on what it is that I'm that I'm presenting. When I do the first, when I first pitch to you an idea that I've got, it's a verbal, it's a conversation, it's something like this. I get real excited, and you know, I, I want to draw you into it. And if it's an animation, generally, what I'll have in a, a, a short sequence, two three minutes long, that I boarded out and made a good animatic of. So I'll pitch it to you, and I'll say, you know what? Let me show you a sample of one of the scenes so you can see the type of humor action that I've got in it. So once I get your attention and you understand the premise, then I'll show you an animatic and then I'll come back to you and go, all right, what do you think? Let's talk about it. So you mentioned animatic again, you mentioned it earlier before. Um, I think animatics are, 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 I mean, I, they're standard, um, particularly in animation. I don't, I don't well, think also can... called like a real um, animatic is just the term that, uh, that I caught my attention first. Okay. Um, but you, you developed 
some storyboarding software, which you said um, actually can you can inside of which you can create the animatic kind of as you go. Yeah, it's not my software, but I did work on the development team of it. Uh, it's called Storyboard Pro. Toon Boom creates it. Okay. And they've got a great team. I came in pretty early on and helped them with how to adjust and revise the software so it worked for live action as well as animation. It was originally made just for animation, but there are a lot of differences between uh, working in the two fields. And I'm an expert in live action as well. So, so they, that's why they brought me in. And we won an Emmy for it in 2012. Uh, primetime engineering Emmy. Um, but yeah, the software allows me, it, it, the software is a combination of Photoshop, After Effects, and Premiere. So I'm able to draw, keep it in layers, move the layers, add camera moves, add audio, organize it with proper numbering, put all dialogue, export out to PDFs, and export a movie all in one software. I never have to leave. So it, the, it saves, to, before it used to take us 10 steps to create an animatic, jumping back and forth between multiple software. So any one change meant going back 10 steps and coming back forward again. In Storyboard Pro, there's a change anywhere in it. I make that one change hit play. It's a huge difference. It, 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 it changed the industry, that one software. <laughs> yeah, that's no surprise. Uh, the very, very limited experience I've seen just with animatic creation, it's exactly what you said, those three programs. It's Photoshop and After Effects and Premiere. And it's like all this gets a little bit clunky. <laughs> yeah. This software is all those put together and better because, because the way it organizes. It just simple little things like renumbering because numbering is hugely important to stay organized. One button, I click one button, everything renumbers. It used to take a half a day to renumber a, a, a big project in, in Photoshop. Now it's literally a second. Uh, you've, you've already kind of answered this one, um, but you know, I've, I've heard it said that the editor is kind of the final storyteller in any project. Yep. Um, would you say that the story artist is maybe the second or third storyteller in a project? I'd say we're probably the third. I mean, the first is the script. Second is the director. The director filters their vision to us. And then you know, uh, you know, what we do guides everything else. So and now that the story artists also have the ability to make the animatic, we're doing the first pass on editing. And, uh, but editors are magical, what they can do on, on changing the tone and pacing of a story. I'm, I'm constantly amazed how, how much a great editor can do to enhance a project. And when you're working with an editor, do they take the export of your, of your animatic and, and work with it there? Or do they go back into the storyboard software and, and change things there? They usually edit in their software, which is a mistake. And it's one of the things I've been writing about for a while and I'm, uh, I'm working on changing the industry. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to change the way editors work because it's wrong. It just, they're, it's lazy on their part and none of them like to hear it, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's, there's newer technology and they need to jump on board. They need to be working in our master software in Storyboard Pro because as they're doing things, we can keep one master file. So as, a, as an editor going through, they'll often say, you know, we need a close up here or we need an establishing shot there. They could just simply click, a, you know, add a blank frame, write what they want, close down the file, we open it and add it in. It doesn't matter how many times you do that, it's perfect organization. And I've done a number of projects where no one leaves sort of a pro until it gets into production flawless it's amazing hmm. every single project that i've worked on where the editors uh, which is any established studio the editors will take it off in theirs and then come back into storable pro screws up every time hmm. there's pro massive problems every time and whenever i sit with production i said this is what's going to happen so yeah that happens every time i said well this is how you change it it's real easy hmm. i do it i can <laughs> i can set it up for you so it's, but it's, it's, um, it's a bigger change than you think it would be to get the industry to work the way I want it to work. I'm slowly getting them there. And because I'm a big voice in storyboarding, uh, I've got a, I've got a better shot than most and I will not stop fighting for it until everyone understands and works the most efficient way that I think production can work. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned um, being a big fan of Woody Woodpecker, you know, with you and your father. 
Um, is there a project you, you look back on that was um, either in terms of the experience or the, or the material itself that you just look back on pretty fondly that was kind of, kind of a favorite or one you're glad you did? Uh, it, look, there's actually quite a few. Um, there's been some surprises along the way and then some that you know, I wanted and it was just as cool as I thought it would be. You know, when I first worked with Spielberg on Sequest, it was back in the early 90s. Oh, yeah. I loved Sequest. Yeah. That, I, I came on the second season. I was a huge fan first season. And, and, you know, Spielberg, it was the biggest show on TV, biggest budget show on TV at the time. It was NBC and science fiction. And I landed doing all the storyboards for it. And it was awesome. I mean, <laughs> yes. I, I had so much fun with that. And I designed some of the ships. I designed some of the characters on the show. It was, huh. it was incredible. Uh, and then there's projects like The Water Boy, if you remember that, uh -huh. um, with Adam Sandler. It, the script was terrible. I just, it was just dreadful. <laughs> and I have seldom laughed harder at a finished movie. That was the surprise. Huh. It was so good. Huh. What I didn't see what the director saw in the script. What he did, I thought was magical. And it showed me how powerful a director can be on taking something. Hmm. He saw the magic and was able to bring it out on the screen. And of course, Sandler was brilliant in it. Whether you love him or hate him, the guy knows his audience. Yeah. I, that shocked me how good that movie was. Huh. Um, and then The Walking Dead. You know, I was, a, I was a huge fan for the first six or seven seasons, whatever it was. And when I decided to move to Atlanta, my first goal was to work on The Walking Dead. And I landed the job three months before I moved here. Now, I got to ask, too, you've, you've already talked quite a bit about, you know, some of the differences between animated storyboarding um, versus television versus live action versus film. Yeah. Would you say, kind of coming back to that, that the major difference tends to be sort of <laughs> how much you board? Yeah, choosing on what you board is a big thing. Uh, we number it totally differently. I mean, just organizationally, it's a complete difference. Um, terminology is different. Uh, what you have to know is different. In, in animation, you draw anything you want. In live action, I have to understand the differences between, um, between the different lenses. I have to know camera gear. Uh, I, I need to understand the, all the different terminology. So, for instance, in animation, anytime the camera moves, it's called a pan. In live action, a pan is where the camera is stationary and it turns left or right. Hmm. If it moves, that's not a pan. That's a dolly or a crane or hmm. a move or a tracking shot. If it, if it looks up, that's a tilt. If it moves up, it's a boom or a crane. So, and, and those are important because... Again, this is the blueprint for all of production to follow. And if you don't know the proper terminology, you're confusing the crew and you're defeating the very purpose of doing storyboards. We describe all of that. If, if the director calls out or a lot of times the director of photography or the DP, they're in the meetings with me and the director. And if they call out something, that means it's important. I make sure to put that in the notes on the storyboard so the whole crew knows. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, then kind of my uh, final question that I've prepared, um, you mentioned um, getting Tarkovsky's primal just in terms of looking at it and saying, like, hey, this is probably, you know, board driven. Is there any project of film or show um, that you, you just look at and you think, man, that is flawless storyboarding. Like those guys, they nailed it. You know, it's funny you bring up uh, broad primal, probably primal, um, it's the most beautiful layouts I've ever seen in a TV series. Um, it, it, it just blows my mind. Uh, there's certain shows that I, there's even a couple of shows that I look at and think I couldn't do, I couldn't work on that. Hmm. Uh, some anime, uh, but uh, there's another one, um, uh, Rick and Morty. Hmm. That, I, I don't think I could storyboard that. It, it's so bizarre that I, my mind just doesn't work that way. I, you know, I'm good at a lot of things. I do a lot of different types of production. Rick and Morty, I, I, my hat's off to those guys. I, <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. And, and I'm glad I get to sit back and just watch it. Uh, how did you get started? And how did you get started in boring? Well, I was, a, I started as a production designer out in, out in Hollywood. 
and I was designing a lot of commercials and TV and movies. I guess I really started movies at Roger Corman's studio. Mm-hmm. And because I had a construction background, so I figured that was my easiest way into Hollywood when I moved out there. And, and I got work instantly. Uh, it was very easy for me. And I just moved up on my first project. I became the art director. Mm-hmm. And and while it was great and I was designing sets and, and things, I wasn't drawing as much and I was really missing drawing. And because I was the production designer, I was seeing storyboards come across my desk. Hmm. And I thought, well, that looks pretty cool. I think I'd really (laughs) prefer doing that. So while I was designing a show for HBO, I went to the biggest agency in the country called Storyboards Inc. And I showed samples to them that, and I asked if they could represent me and they said, no, you suck. And I said, well, what could I do better? And they gave me samples and shoved me out the door. And I showed up a week later with new samples. And they said, well, better, not good. Here's some other ideas. Here's what you need to work on. A week later, I showed up again. And I showed up every week with new samples until they said, yep, that's good. And they gave me a Honda commercial. And that started me. So then the HBO show I was on, I went to the executive producer. And I said, here's some samples of storyboards. I'm sure you're going to need them at some point. You're paying for me anyway. Let me do them for you. And a week later, he called me and said, yep, I've got an episode. I'd like you to storyboard for us, and I'm going to pay you extra for it. And that was my first big credit. And I, I guess I was doing them both side by side until Spielberg came in to Orlando. This is when I was living in Orlando. When he brought Sequest in, I walked over and met a bunch of people and within 15 minutes i was offered storyboarding and that was it i went full-time storyboarding on that show holy cow (laughs) that's so cool (laughs) uh mark i appreciate this conversation Uh, any final thoughts or any last words look anyone who wants to who loves drawing storyboarding is a great gig to get into pays well i love literally every day I get up and I cannot wait to dive in to, uh, to what I'm doing again. Look, it's, it's cool. I have fun. No such thing as a starving artist. Parents, there's more jobs for artists than any other career in the world. So support your kids. Artists are what make life worth living. <laughs>